Hello, I am Dr. Tin. I am now going to discuss about cerebral palsy. Child with cerebral palsy would say that there's nothing wrong with me. I just have cerebral palsy. Do you know cerebral palsy is non-contagious, chronic, permanent, non-progressive, incurable, however, manageable? At the end of this lecture, the students should understand. Definition Causes Classification And Principles of Management for Cerebral Palsy Cerebral palsy is defined as a disorder of movement and posture, resulting from permanent non-progressive defect or lesion of an immature brain. Cerebral palsy can occur due to antenatal, perinatal, and postnatal causes. Antenatal causes include Congenital malformation of the brain, intrauterine torch, toxoplasma, rubella, cytomegalovirus and herpes simplex infections, radiation, trauma, drugs such as anti-epileptics, and antipartum hemorrhage causing fetal hypoxia. Perinatal causes include prematurity, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and birth injuries resulting in intracranial bleed. Postnatal causes include kernicterus, hypoglycemia, meningitis, encephalitis, and head injury. There are four main types of cerebral palsy. They are spastic, dyskinetic, ataxic, and mixed type. Spastic is the commonest type of cerebral palsy. It occurs as a result of damage to the motor cortex. Patients with this type of cerebral palsy typically manifest signs of upper motor neuron lesion including increased tone, brisk deep tendon reflexes, ankle clonus, and extensor plantar response. Spastic type of cerebral palsy can be subclassified according to limbs involvement, which are hemiplegia, diplegia, and quadriplegia. In spastic hemiplegic cerebral palsy, one side of the body, either right or left is involved. The patients typically have fisting of the hand, pronated flexed forearm, and tiptoe walking on the affected side. The intelligence is usually good. In spastic diplegic cerebral palsy, all four limbs are involved. However, the lower limbs are more affected than the upper limbs. This type of cerebral palsy is commonly seen in ex-premature babies. In spastic quadriplegic cerebral palsy, all four limbs are equally involved. It is the worst type and associated with mental retardation, seizures, swallowing difficulties secondary to pseudo-vulgar palsy and global developmental delay. Dyskinetic cerebral palsy occurs due to damage to basal ganglia, such as in bilirubin encephalopathy or kernicterus. It is characterized by dystonia and involuntary movements, such as aphtoid or cauteria. Dystonia is involuntary sustained muscle contractions resulting in twisting and reparative movements or abnormal postures. Please watch the video on dystonia. Haphatoid is slow, involuntary, writhing movements which mainly affect the fingers, hands, toes, and feet. Please see a video on aphtoid. Chorea is abrupt, irregular, jerky involuntary movements of limbs and face. Please watch the video on chorea. In this type of cerebral palsy, the intelligence is relatively unimpaired. Ataxic cerebral palsy occurs due to damage in cerebellar area. Initially the patients usually present with hypotonia. Cerebellar signs typically manifest later. They include nystagmus, slurred speech, intention tremor, past pointing in finger nose test, dysdiatokinesic, and ataxic gait. Please watch the video on a child with ataxic cerebral palsy. This is summarized picture of the various types of cerebral palsy and the corresponding areas of brain involved.
Cerebral palsy should be considered if there is abnormal tone and posture in early infancy, persistence of primitive reflexes such as moral reflex, delayed motor milestones, abnormal gait, developmental delay in language and social skills, hand preference in those less than 12 months old as this can be a sign of hemiplegic cerebral palsy, feeding difficulties such as automotor and coordination, slow feeding hand vomiting. Diagnosis of cerebral palsy is based mainly on clinical features that I've mentioned earlier. So taking a careful history and performing a detailed clinical examination are the most important steps in establishing the diagnosis. There are no definitive laboratory studies for diagnosing cerebral palsy. The blood tests are done as deemed necessary based on clinical examination. The investigations that can be considered are thyroid function test, metabolic and genetic studies. Neuroimaging studies can help to evaluate brain damage and identify babies who are at risk of developing cerebral palsy. Ultrasonography can delineate gross structural abnormalities and show evidence of hemorrhage or hypoxic ischemic injury. Computed tomography scanning of the brain helps to identify congenital malformations, intracranial hemorrhage and periventricular glucomolacia more clearly than ultrasonography, but its use is associated with significant exposure to radiation. Magnetic resonance imaging of the brain is the diagnostic neuroimaging study of choice and should be considered in all cases. It defines cortical, white matter structures and abnormalities more clearly than any other modalities of imaging. We could do some investigations to detect some of the underlying pathologies and complications. They are Ultrasound of head in preterm infants for interventricular hemorrhage MRI brain for white matter lesions Metabolic studies may reveal inherited metabolic disorders. Genetic studies may be indicated to rule out a genetic syndrome if dysmorphic features or abnormalities of various organ systems are present. Coagulation studies are done in case with unexplained cerebral infarction seen in neuroimaging, and EEG which is important in the diagnosis of associated seizure disorders. This is an image from a brain ultrasound in a baby with grade 3 interventricular hemorrhage. The left ventricle is dilated and filled with blood as shown with the white arrow. This is a magnetic resonance image brain of a child with spastic quadriplegic cerebral palsy with more prominent right-sided deficits. It shows cystic encephalomalacia in the left temporal and parietal regions, delayed myelination, decreased white matter volume and enlarged ventricles. Patients with cerebral palsy may have several complications. These include neurological complications such as mental retardation epilepsy, visual and hearing impairment, musculoskeletal complications such as contractures, scoliosis, hip dislocation and bed sores, respiratory complications such as aspiration pneumonia, and gastrointestinal complications such as failure to thrive, feeding intolerance, gastroesophageal reflux and constipation. The aims in the management of patients with cerebral palsy are for them to lead as near normal life as possible and to have independent life as much as possible. So it is important to counsel the parents regarding the diagnosis, prognosis and plan of management. In essence, multidisciplinary team approach is the mainstay of management. In this multidisciplinary approach, pediatrician plays the key role is in identifying complications as mentioned before, and in coordinating the referrals to the respective disciplines. The personnel involved in the management of cerebral palsy patients include physiotherapist to improve gross motor function and prevention of contractures, occupational therapist to help in daily functioning, hand skills and home modifications, speech therapist for speech and language development, Dietitian for input on feeding and nutrition. Psychologist for intellectual assessment and behavioral management. Social worker to advise on benefits for children with special needs.
ophthalmologist for eye problems such as strabismus, cataracts and refractive issues. ENT and audiologist for hearing assessment and management. Surgeon for PEG tube insertion in cases with feeding difficulties. Orthopedic surgeon for tenotomy or tendon lengthening and contractures. Neurologist for epilepsy management. And dentist for dental management. Patients with cerebral palsy may also have other problems that need to be addressed. For example, spasticity of limbs is treated with baclofen, a agonist, and intramuscular injection of botulinum toxin, which is an exotoxin produced by clostridium that prevents release with cetocholine at the neuromuscular junction. Dystonia, which is a feature of patients with dyskinetic cerebral palsy may also respond to baclofen. Constipation is managed with diet rich in fiber and stool softener such as syrup lactulose. Patients with gastroesophageal reflux disease may respond to thickening of the feeds, such as using the anterior flux formula. Administration of proton pump inhibitors such as omeprazole is effective in reducing the acidity of the gastric content and improving erosive esophagitis. In summary, Cerebral palsy is a chronic, non-progressive, disorder of movement and posture. Careful history taking and physical examination are the most important tools in establishing the diagnosis. The key management is multidisciplinary team approach.